Uh, yeah, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you again for the invitation. Um, I was asked to talk about our autopulmonary venous, veno venous collaterals, uh, blood vessels out of control. And when I tried to clarify that with Stefan Schubert, he written me an email saying, es geht generell um kollateralen in jeglichen Zuständen und bei jeglichen Patienten, which I thought was a bit vicious. Um, anyway, it's a very heterogeneous group of problems, uh, and I want to basically touch on major autopulmonary collateral arteries and also bronchial and intercostal arteries. Systemic venous fissure, and then a couple of cases of, let's say, uh, combined problems, including pulmonary venous, arterial venous fistula. Having said that, reading the program in more detail, I know that Sven Dietrich is talking about that later. And so this is basically a summary. There um, are a couple of um, baddies out there. Uh, MAF gas in pulmonary trees, VSD follow, is really a complex lesion, highly variable, and bad natural history, as we all know. Um, there is, however, still debate of what these MAPGAS actually are, and with that I want to recap some of the embryology, and we have to remind ourselves that central pulmonary arteries are derived from the six aortic arches. They do make the uh, right pulmonary artery, the ductus, and also possibly part of the um, left pulmonary artery. Yeah, yeah, but for laser? Laser? Yeah. So pulmonary atresia develops because of six aortic arches fail to develop. Six aortic arches undergo or they undergo go early involution. However, how then do the, lung, uh, do the lungs develop in patients with pulmonary atresia? And the, the lungs actually develop before the six aortic arches and uh, basically um, the, um, we take to some extent some um, objection with the uh, idea of the, uh, the Melbourne group that major autopulmonary collateral arteries are really just dilated bronchial arteries. And when you look at it in the non-human embryo, the lungs develop at the 13 millimeter stage, which is about 28 days. And from these um, buds or uh, early embryological pulmonary plexus, um, they develop really the precursors which ultimately form the segmental pulmonary arteries and the veins. And those embryological plexuses are also reached by systemic arteries which develop from the dorsal aortic arches. Um, and this is an early work by Boyden in 1970, um, basically showing that the, the bronchial artery doesn't work now. Anyway, the bronchial artery is developed uh, really um, from, from the ductus over there, whereas there are already segmental arteries. And classical examples of that, for example, is a case where there's only mapka supply to one lung. You will always find a native pulmonary artery to the other lung. In Birmingham, certainly, we uh, try to recruit as many of these segmental pulmonary arteries, whereas the MAPGAS, the central pulmonary arteries, um, they are pretty useless, and you have to really reconstruct from hilum to hilum to make these segmental arteries grow. Um, and there, again, the central pulmonary artery, or the, the central arteries, which are probably derived from the bronchioles, not so much the, the peripheral arteries, they have a high, a high tendency for progressive long segment stenosis. There's a high risk of dissection, aneurysm formation after balloon angioplasty. And there's also a high risk of pulmonary hemorrhage, neointima occlusion after stenting. Oops. Um, and small and stenosed mapgas are best left alone. We should rather focus on identifying the natural or the native pulmonary arteries, and we should generate blood flow to these being stenting of the RVOT or central shunt. Unifocalization may not be uh, as effective as planned, and however, there's only one chance at recru recruitment. We require serial calf interventions, and these vessels truly behave abnormally. <coughs> Some water. Um, 
Now the um, situation in um, collaterals after um, arterial switch or tetralogy or follow are somewhat different, and there are probably two dilated pulmonary arteries. Um, they may significantly impact on the post-operative course, as shown in the paper here by the Zurich group. Um, also, there are significant hemodynamic factors for collateral arteries, as we heard in some of the talks this morning, and these include pulmonary artery stenosis, branch stenosis, or uh, um, hypoplasia of, of pulmonary arteries. Um, this is an example of a case where there's underdevelopment of the native left pulmonary artery, and where there's a very significant development of collateral arteries doesn't work, um, to the left lung. Um, this morning, again, very interesting insight into angiogenesis. I think one factor which we also have to include is hypoxia-inducible factors, um, HIF, L1 alpha and 1 beta. They normally, or they happen ubiquitously, however, in, in normoxia, they are basically generally inactivated immediately. However, in chronic hypoxia, um, a, a, I HIF 1 alpha accumulates rapidly and combines down uh, with 1 beta to activate downstream um, genes of vascular endothelial growth factor, inducible nitric oxide and endothelin 1 expression. And this leads to angiogenesis. Um, it's a universal process as seen also in wound healing, tumor growth, endometriosis, or arthritis. Um, another example of a girl with recurrent chest infections, right lung hypoplasia, and aberrant origin of the right pulmonary artery from the ductus, which is now closed. Um, and you see the really uh, engorgement and enlargement of these very tortuous bronchial arteries trying to keep the right lung alive and perfused. Um, another example, a 10-month-old girl uh, who is on a palliative care pathway, left HRI summarism, and so forth, She's still alive, the duct is closed, saturation 65%, hemoglobin 210. And this is, she's alive because of all these torches vessels forming up from the descending aorta. And these are really bronchial arteries supplying some sort of blood supply to the lung. Um, in univentricular hearts, we see it also quite commonly. This is a case with steel or sclerosis of the left pulmonary vein. And you see the collateral from the uh, thoracic arteries and so on to the left lung, again, providing some sort of minimal blood supply in single lung physiology. In, and Peter alluded to it, out upon the collaterals, we see uh, universally in chronic hypoxemia, uh, branch PA stenosis hypoplasia. And certainly in the univentricular uh, situation, um, it's probably the hypoxia which drives the development of this. Could they be good for anything? Yes, probably. They provide additional pulmonary artery blood flow, uh, and as long as the patient is cyanosed, this blood flow can actually contribute to oxygen uptake. And also in the univentricular situation, it may help preload to a chronically underfilled ventricle. Um, there's great debate as to whether we should, uh, these should be coiled, uh, and at times this debate is fairly heated, uh, almost like religious wars. And there's a vast difference in practice between countries and also health insurance reimbursement. Um, there's conflicting evidence in literature uh, and there are a huge amount of papers on MRI quantification of these collaterals, uh, which is part of an industry, I think. Um, and the jury is still out. Again, as I said, there are many conflicting papers. Um, at BCH, we only occlude if there are huge uh, autopomony collaterals with a dilated left ventric and significant AV valve regurgitation, and also in cases uh, where we list patients for transplantation because they probably decrease, or uh, coiling these may decrease the post-operative risk for bleeding. As I said, the jury is still out. There, I believe there's an ongoing US prospective randomized trial but when you look at the bottom curve, there was really no difference in uh, length of hospital stay in patients who had either coiling or no coiling, 
And also, you see there no significant difference between the groups of coil versus no coil. And this is a distribution of, I think, seven or eight centers in the US um, in terms of how many of them do call the collaterals before. Now, coming to systemic venous fistula, it's important to remind ourselves that all veins are connected. Um, there's communication between the azygos, hemiazygos, para paravertebral system to both the inferior and superior vena cava. And to me, uh, I think it's important to remember that the, the diaphragm is actually some sort of watershed area. And I'll come back to that. And blood is really always seeks the path of least resistance, thus, uh, if there's blockage, there will be always other vessels forming up. In the univentricle, after bidirectional cave formation, uh, we have a driving pressure between the superior vena cava and the left atrium or right atrium of something like three to five millimeter mercury. And with that, there's a huge tendency to open up systemic venous collaterals. Um, in the old days of mustard procedure, we have seen quite often if the uh, superior limb was obstructed, there was azygos runoff down to the IVC or vice versa. And in the capable may shunt circulation, certainly it's a pressure gradient between the SVC and IVC which drives the development of these vessels. However, I dare say um, these are warning signs because quite often patients with the same transfaminate gradient may not uh, open up any collaterals, whereas others do. Um, this is an example of a 16-year-old boy, trisomy 21, unbalanced AVSD, previous PA band and CP shunt, uh, and that was uh, complicated by yeah, weeks and weeks and weeks of pleural effusion, and we certainly did not consider him to be a Fontan candidate. And we had previous attempts at occluding some of these collaterals, but you see they open up again because the driving pressure is still there, and then classically they gain access to the paravertebral system and then go down to the diaphragm and come back up to the IVC. You see that better in this shot. Um, and unless you block them off really at the level of the diaphragm, they will just recur. And one thing we are doing now in the big one certainly is we try to enter them from the renal veins or from below the diaphragm and then block off both limbs of this common pathway. Another example, left HR summarism. Uh, after Kawashima type operation, um, and you see systemic venous collaterals, but also when you look carefully, there's some filling of the azygos vein here, or hemiazygos, I should say. Um, and again there, and in all these with Kawashima type circulation in, in unexpected desaturation, you should have a good look at the um, hemiazygos or below, well below the diaphragm, normally at the renal vessels, and there may be very significant fistula there. And again, we block these off and delay front time completion. Now, a couple of cases of combined pro problems is a case after cable shun, reopening left SVC coronary sinus, but you see also the washing into the pulmonary arteries, so there will be systemic arterial collaterals big heart, high LA pressure, and high um, SVC pressure. Another example, this is fairly early after cable pulmonary shunt, and you see washing again into the PAs, narrow LPA, systemic venous fistula, uh, and humongous amount of systemic arter arterial collaterals. Again, we don't know quite understand why all this happens. Um, and you can spend hours in the cath lab uh, trying to rectify that situation, but unless you take away the causative factor, which is, in, to a large extent, the hypoxia, uh, these things will just recur. Um, in patients with pulmonary artery venous fistula, it is largely believed that reconnecting or putting in some um, hepatic venous factor or hepatic venous blood into the circulation that these fistula resolve this is the case uh, with very significant pulmonary AVMs, both on the right and on the left side. And then we put a shunt in from the aorta to the LPA effectively, and they disappeared here on the left side, but certainly are still fairly prevalent on the right. Um, 
there has been some work done by also in particular Joseph Vettukatil, and I think it's now believed that it's really one of these micro RNAs, which is the hepatic factor, which the French call antifistoly. Um, this final example is a two-year-old two uh, boy, trichospidotresia, uh, tr um, trichospidotresia transposition, and basically had a CP shunt developed severe AVMs on the uh, left lung, uh, right lung, and we went for an early fontan, which was a lateral tunnel, pleurifusion, SVC pressure 20, and his saturations really improved remarkably quickly to 95% after two weeks created a fenestration, however, he did not improve, and then basically taking the front hand down transcatheter, uh, which gave him three years, but now, unfortunately, the pulmonary AVMs have returned again. So, in conclusion, uh, thanks to Stefan Schubert, it's a very wide topic. I hope I could elucidate or remind you of some embryological factors and homeopathic factors but more importantly also some hemodynamic factors which contribute to these uh, lesions. I think the management of these must be individualized and unless we're taking out the underlying cause, um, the recurrence is fairly high. Thank you.